it's another installment of following in the footsteps of Isabella Bird. Yes, and I'm in blue today. Well, you know, one's got to change one's shirt now and then. Uh, so um, what, what can I tell you now? Well, we've got to the stage where J.G. Davidson um, was the, the resident of, the British resident of Selangor. Though how official that was, I do not know, but um, he doesn't seem to have lasted very long because he fell out with uh, Tenku Kudin, most likely over uh, money. There seem to have been some uh, uh, problems with the accounts, to say the least, and uh, there were all those Pahang troops uh, left around unpaid. And J.G. Davidson um, became ill. Now, in, this could be that, uh, uh, you know, the mosquito sound that you hear buzzing around. Uh, yeah, well, it could have been a bit of that malaria, because, you know, that was getting a lot of them. Or it could have been a diplomatic uh, illness of sorts. Um, he had an assistant, and this assistant was Douglas Bloomfield. And Douglas Bloomfield was curiously ha happy, let's put it that way. Uh, that's the best way of describing it. Um, he expressed a certain amount of joy at being offered the position of, of the British residency. Um, though he, he, he complained that uh, it was on uncertain terms. He was not sure whether he was going to be in, in it for very long or not. And, uh, you know, um, perhaps it was a trial period. Uh, it, it, it all seems a bit vague really. And Frank Swetnam was um, perhaps the only one that had direct lines to the, the more important people back in the colonial office and, uh, and other places. Um, you know, he was a young man with interesting contacts, let us say, uh, but not well liked uh, down in uh, Singapore. However, uh, his career was for the future. Douglas Bloomfield his career was in the ascendancy and he took it on board with characteristic energy and this is something that uh, everybody says about the, the man uh, that he was uh, extremely energetic um, nobody quite knew how old he was I mean this is a guy who outlived two wives and several children and at the age of 75 he claimed he was 65 and uh, started a new career in Canada um, and also got married again, which kind of indicates that he had a certain amount of charm as well as energy. <clears throat> or perhaps it was, was it, it was this energy that, uh, uh, that attracted women, uh, but it did not attract Isabella. And, or maybe he wasn't attracted to Isabella, but perhaps that was her thing, because normally she goes for these, these ruggy traps, but uh, no, you know, he, he wasn't just rugged. He was a guy who liked to dress up in fancy clothes, and he liked the pomp and ceremony. He liked to put on a big show. He was a big, loud talker, and uh, he liked to live a champagne life. But he also enjoyed the rugged side of things. He, he was a man that, um, he got involved with the nitty-gritty of everyday Malay life. He, he was in in amongst them, uh, finding out what was going on, what was wrong with the system. He, he wanted to reform things. He wanted to centralise everything under the power of Abdul Samad. He wanted to get rid of all the uh, petty rajas and, and their taxes and what have you. He was trying to get rid of all this sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, he was a man with a lot of experience of dealing with some very hard cases. Uh, he, he'd uh, fought with uh, the, the Brooks against pirates uh, in Borneo, and uh, he was around whilst the um, uh, Rajah Mahdi and his bunch were slitting throats and chopping off British officers' heads uh, and so on. And uh, he, he was uh, he, he's, he was around when Chinese were were rioting and fighting, and and five thousand of them got killed in a war in. Uh, Larut, we'll deal with that later on. But, you know, it, this is a man who, um, he was, had been the assistant of J.G. Davidson, and J.G. Davidson was very much aware that the uh, security 
uh, the safety issue for uh, British residents was paramount. And J.J. Jefferson was a little bit um, worried about that. This is one of the reasons why he went, went to London to try and, uh, and launch a company which had the, the right, the legal right, given by the, one of the, uh, the foreign officers, to give him the legal right to, to raise his own army. Um, yeah, there was obviously, uh, you know, financial reasons for, for that, if we wanted it to protect the minefields, which were British minefields, and so, so on and so forth. So, he, Bloomfield Douglas had been brought up uh, into his position, we're surrounded by these experiences, whereas Isabel Bird didn't seem to quite cotton on to that. And when she arrived in uh, Clang and found um, that every night there was some sort of uh, military um, exercise going on. There was always an alarm being rang and, and the troops were always being brought out and to check the periphery. Uh, whenever the slightest um, sighting of, a, uh, of an unknown Malay came, came across the, uh, the periphery, it, it, all hell was let loose and, and Douglas was out there yelling at people to get in uh, to, to be alert and to to guard properly and and to take notes and those drills and the and ex inspections and she hated all that she hated all that whereas oh bluefield Douglas seemed to love all that as well he loved all that soldiering thing and and he thought that would impress her i, I think a lot of it was put on uh, to show her um when she was obviously um unimpressed by that he invites her on this trip up the river and in the luxury yacht which um well the luxury yacht seems to have been a little bit more luxurious than the uh, sultan ever really wanted and doesn't sound like the sultan got much use out of his luxury yacht and in fact um uh, bluefield douglas spent a lot of the sultan's money on a new palace which was equipped with western furniture and paintings uh, Bluefield Douglas was a bit of an artist himself. He, he painted some rather nice sea, seascapes. Uh, so, so he was interested in Western art and and uh, so he put up Western paintings. And uh, he was also very much interested in uh, champagne, just as uh, uh, Isabella Bird was. But um, he, he had the Sultan put in a good wine cellar. Well, you know, what, what's the point of being a Sultan if you cannot entertain important people in a after a fashion that shows that you are a sultan. Goodness me, sultan backed by the British at that. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it, it was all a display to show that if you joined in with the British and, and left all that protection thing and the administration uh, of the finances to good old solid British bankers and soldiers and s servicemen and, and, well, rather... Curious characters like Bloomfield who really came out of Australia and uh, stealing my money from miners and, well, you know, a bankrupt like, well, they, you know, he had a bit of a checkered past, but, you know, he, he was he was there to to solve real problems in a hard way and and make that sultan look like a real sultan, like a real short sultan should who was in, in charge. And, and Isabella, she went up that river with them and she said it was, she, how much was she said, how much she enjoyed herself and, and that it was a tropic dream. That's what she said, a tropic dream. Ah, so it, 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 it was a, a rather mixed message that she was, so she was given. Uh, so perhaps she, uh, some of it must have come from what she learned about some of the, uh, financial skullduggery that was going on and underlying uh, uh, underlying um, uh, Douglas's uh, regime. I mean, he, his son-in-law and daughter were out there, and they were getting special privileges, to say the least. Uh, 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 one of the reasons why Emily Innes hated him was because uh, he kicked them out of this nice, nice new bungalow that they had on Dukra Hill, and and gave it to his son-in-law. Well, you know that would annoy you considerably. Uh, anyway, he set up this, uh, this nice system and Abdul Samet, in, a, in his crusty old way, spent a lot of time just salting a bit of money away, putting him into uh, cases under his bed and hiding it, it around, obviously trying to keep it out of the hands of this guy and also preparing, just in case, uh, 
to run off and um, set up his own regime somewhere else up the river or somewhere. You know, he, he, he was a bit old school. Even so, uh, Isabella, when she was introduced to him, she said he was the most prepossessing male, male, prepossessing Malay that she'd ever seen. Now then, if, if you take a look at these photos of this wizened little man, all kind of small and and sort of with a twisted face and you know there was a... prepossessing is, is not the word that one describes such a character as this uh, in his clothes that barely fit him and so on, which had of course been um, made by the British uh, they were trying to make him like a Indian Sultan and so well, you know they fancied him up a bit and uh, it, Whatever one says about the guy, though, when when they all, I think it's when they start to talk to him. That's when he becomes alive. It's not, he, he wasn't so physically a, a great presence, but he was noted for being rather funny and charming and uh, kind of optimistic. It's sort of he, there was something above the revolutionary about him in a strange sort of way. You know what was going on there? I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, and he remained like that till, till his uh, end of his days, of it, when he was, he was 90 odd years old. And he, he lasted an awful long time. And, and uh, he was noted for being a guy who took it as a, he, he sort of rolled with, he went with the rolls, or if what's the right term. Anyway, he took it as it came. He, you know, so there's something admirable about uh, this character that everybody, the older he got and the longer he, he lasted, the, the more everybody kind of cottoned on to what a miracle it was that he'd survived and um, and in the end created this state. Uh, Bloomfield Douglas on the other hand, well yes he's, he's definitely got a bad reputation from Isabella but um, you know, the, even the guy that sacked him, which was Governor Weld, uh, he, he said, talked about him as someone with prodigious energy who um, for all his faults had many, many virtues that he was certain that the Sultan and, and many a Malay would actually miss. Uh, you know, so six or one half dozen of the, of the other. So uh, obviously um, Douglas had issues, but there weren't issues that he was particularly aware of, I, I think. I think that was perhaps his total ability to ignore reality in, in many respects, uh, certainly his own age, um, and, and just bullshit and press and so on. He, he did have a plan and you know, he, he perhaps put it into operation, but uh, in the end um, he got kicked out and we had uh, a new, well, what did they, who did they put in his place? I think it was Swettenham that get, they came in. Uh, no, uh, yes, Swettenham. Isabella's state of mind at the end of this uh, trip uh, to the state council, see the state council being run on Jogra Hill, um, well uh, one she she was not overly impressed by all the pomp and circumstance that uh, Douglas and, and Daly and uh, his entourage sort of enacted, she thought it was, a, seems to have thought it was all absurd. Um, she wondered why they were doing, doing this uh, because uh, what they didn't, what she didn't seem to cotton on to, is that um, the state council at that point was was kind of brand new, and and it was and it was designed to impress all the petty rajahs that, uh, in effect, Abdul Stamak was in charge, and the British were letting him rule. The British were were only there to enable him to rule, and he could do anything. He he, he could sentence people to death and and what have you. Well, almost anything, uh, because he had to work within the British legal rules, which uh, was supposed to be uh, dependent upon hard evidence. Uh, although in the next blog we'll we'll see a little bit more about how uh, Douglas. Um, Sort of held uh, these courts, so what what he did uh, in in legal courts and what have you, and how kind of they they were uh, they were a bit mixed up in in which law they were trying to apply. It was a bit that's rough justice at the same time, but you know uh, they were trying, and so uh, it was meant to show off that uh, this 
Sultan was now in charge, the British were his allies, and um, if you came uh, through your lot in with the Brits, you would, well, get a shitload of money, basically, and, and do very well for yourself. Uh, and poor old Emily, Emily, uh, Isabella, poor old Isabella, she got bitten to death by mosquitoes. Well, not quite to death, but uh, she has a long moan against how horrific and miserable her life was uh, was made by the mosquitoes. She was bitten everywhere, bitterly bitten. And that was her day out, so to speak. That's it. Looks, um, look, like, like, subscribe, share, and uh, you can read all about this uh, at uh, lawrencegray.net stroke travel with that capital T. And um, I'll see you at the next one. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.